Okay, what does it mean for a sequence to converge? That simply means that the terms in the sequence settle down to a nice finite value. So we can state this with limit notation as follows. So there it is. The sequence converges if the large n limit of the term settles down to some finite number. And we call that number the limit of the sequence. Finally, if a sequence doesn't converge, then we say it diverges. And there's a couple ways that could happen. One is if this limit blows up to infinity, and the other is if the limit simply does not exist. Okay, so for example, you could have an an generated by, uh, by a function that just keeps growing as n grows. And you could go to infinity and you would call that a divergent sequence. Or you could have an an generated by like a sine or a cosine, for example, where it's just constantly oscillating between negative 1 and 1, and it never settles down to some finite value. So that would be a case where the limit doesn't exist. In either case, you would say the sequence diverges. The other sort of theoretical point I want to make on this slide is that we can talk about the terms of a sequence being generated by a function operating on integers. For example, what if I had like an f of n equals 1 over n? Then I could say a1 is f of 1. Give me 1 over 1. a2 is f of 2. Give me 1 half, and so on and so on and so on. Well, occasionally it's advantageous to compare this function on integers to a function on all real numbers. So there's a little theorem that says if the terms of a sequence are generated by some function f and the limit of that function on the set of real numbers exists and is equal to l, then the limit of the sequence is also equal to l. And I'll show an example of this in just a minute. But the point is that I can compare to some function of, of the set of real numbers and apply calculus to it in order to figure out stuff about the limits of a sequence on the set of integers. Uh, this is advantageous because it allows us, for example, to use L'Hopital's rule in one of these limits. All right, let's check out the limits of a few sequences. Um, in the first example, we're asked to investigate the convergence of the sequence 1 over n. And so I look at the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n. And we're not doing anything too formal here. I can see that if I plug in infinity for n, I have 1 divided by infinity, which is unambiguously 0. And so the limit of this sequence is equal to 0, and it converges. Um, another way to say it is 1 over n converges to 0. Let's check out the next one. Um, the next one I think I'd like to do in two different ways. So I'm going to look at the limit as n goes to infinity, n squared plus 1 over 3n squared minus 2n. And if I put on my physics hat for a moment, um, you can make an argument about which terms are dominating the numerator and denominator. So if you imagine n is like a million, then n squared is so much bigger than this constant that the constant makes a negligible correction to the numerator. Likewise, the n squared in the denominator makes it so the 2n term is negligible. It's affecting the result like six decimal places later. So from that sort of approximation standpoint, I can say that this is approximately going to give me the limit as n goes to infinity of just the highest power terms in the numerator and denominator. Okay, I can then simplify by canceling those n squareds, and I get one-third. And the limit as n goes to infinity of one-third is just one-third. Now, sometimes in a calculus class, you're required to show some in-between steps instead of taking that approximation perspective. And so here's the standard thing to do. You would figure out what's the highest power of n and divide everything by that. Then I can apply the limit to the numerator and denominator separately and to each term in the numerator and denominator separately. So there's a theorem telling you that limits work in this very simple way. And I end up with just a limit as n goes to infinity of a constant 1 on top plus a limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n squared, and then a limit as n goes to infinity of 3, and then minus a limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over n and so this is a way of, of being a little bit more formal about it. 
but unless you've rigorously proven this limit and this limit earlier in your course, this is still not really a formal answer, um, but it's kind of the standard way it's done in intro calc. So the limit of 1 over n squared, we consider that to be unambiguous, and it's clear that it's going to 0. And 2 over n also clearly going to 0. So those two terms are gone, and then the limit of a constant is just the constant. So I end up with a 1 in the numerator, 3 in the denominator. All right, so either way, this sequence has converged to 1 third. So it just means the terms become arbitrarily close to 1 third as n becomes large. The third example is interesting. I have n squared over e to the n. And if I look at the large n limit of that, that's like infinity over infinity. So how do you handle that? The answer is using L'Hopital's rule. But here's where we have to use that, that third sort of theoretical point on the previous slide. I can compare to a function on the real numbers and take its limit. And if that settles down to a finite number, that's the same as the limit of the sequence itself. So what I'm going to do here is examine the limit as x goes to infinity of x squared over e to the x. And this is an infinity over infinity indeterminate form. So I can use L'Hopital's rule, which says you independently differentiate the numerator and denominator, and you're going to get the same limit. Well, the derivative of e to the x is just itself, so it's just going to keep popping up in the denominator. I have to use L'Hopital's rule again, and I get 2 over e to the x. And at this point, we say it's unambiguous. If I take e to an enormous number in the denominator and do 2 divided by that enormous number, I'm going to get something arbitrarily close to 0. Therefore, my original sequence, n squared over e to the n, converges to 0.